Is everybody thinks, but well, it can't be that bad, can it? And you're going, mate, you've got no idea. I had no idea until I read up on the stuff, and you're thinking, can it be that awful? But everything coming back says that it is. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those weird British things when they go about, it's all the Brit spirit. And that drives me crazy too. I remember, you know, when it, when it was the Queen's Jubilee a couple of years ago, and uh, the BBC interviewed a guy watching the flotilla go past on the Thames, and he had an umbrella in the rain. And they said, oh, you're standing here in the rain with an umbrella. What's that all about? He said, well, it's the Blitz spirit. And I thought, an umbrella in the rain? As opposed to the Germans bombing your houses? I think you've mixed the, Brit the Blitz spirit up a bit. And there is this kind of, we're all sleepwalking to something that we don't understand and that's the reality and that's what's hard to wake people up about so any, any questions for our experts can i just ask lately it seems that, that people are saying that if Theresa comes back with any kind of a shitty deal there'll be huge pressure on soft remainers in parliament and the bloody labor party to to vote it through is that the biggest danger that we've got at the moment? I mean, it seems quite a cynical ploy, doesn't it, from the government's point of view? No, you realise... Do you want to answer Yeah, you realise um, that, that that is a big uh, thing. And, and, and when um, Jason and I went over to Brussels, uh, we did have conversations, which went along the lines of... They're sort of telling us all this stuff that we need to know. And then we're like, have you got anything that you want to say? And we're like, yeah. Can you just tell Theresa May? No. It's, they're well within the rights to do that. So the only options when she gets back from Brussels next week or whenever these political talks end is no deal or no Brexit. And, and by the way, don't think that if you have another referendum, it's going to be a knife edge thing again. I know a lot of people haven't changed their minds, but we got 48% of the, of the voting population voters to vote Remain with the worst campaign in British <laughs> political history, with David Cameron as leader of it. And we still got 48%. With your help and your support and all the different groups, the Remain groups all around the United Kingdom, if we get the people's vote, this time we will smash it out of the ballpark. <laughs> I'll, I'll look back at this. I'll wait for Terry. I'm going to take a question from Mike if possible. Um, I spend a lot of time out arguing with people while discussing with people, particularly about the Irish border. Thank you. Um, what I struggle with is the argument that, you know, we understand Customs Union required the border. The argument that I get back, that I struggle to answer, is that, well, they have different tax rates, they have different guarantee rates, they have different uh, fuel duty levies. How is that border police at the moment? How can I give a solid answer back to that question? Okay, there's a really simple answer, and of course this is part of the this is part of the, 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 the deliberate leave propaganda to try and belittle the Irish border question and make it feel like it's just been deliberately manufactured by the EU as a way of punishing for Little Britain. The easy answer is very, very common sense actually. You say, okay, every country in the world has different VAT rates, different fuel rates, different different income taxes, different regimes, yet they all have customs borders. Every country in the world has a customs border. You'd have thought that if it was as easy as just saying we have different income tax, we can live with that, the borders wouldn't be a problem anywhere in the world. There isn't a single pair of territories anywhere on planet Earth that have managed to solve the problem of having different regulatory standards and tariff regimes and not having an enforceable border. And we are not going to discover the secret of alchemy in the next two weeks, which will suddenly make these problems disappear. So the answer is a really common sense answer. If that were true, why does the world have borders? 
And the world clearly has borders, so it cannot be true. And it's a little bit like when people say to you, you know, the world, the world not that I'm suggesting that people say this on a regular basis, but this is the type of argument it is. The moon is made of candy floss. And you say, well, the moon isn't made of candy floss. And they say, prove it to me. <laughs> and you say, well, well, I can't prove it myself, but we all know it's not made of candy floss. We know that. And yet they still think the onus is on you to prove that the moon is not made of candy floss. Sorry, if everyone on planet Earth that has different customs and regulations has a customs border, the moon is not made of candy floss. And I think that's the way you deal with that question. Thank you. Can I do a lot to that as well? Um, yeah, well, there's one thing about the Irish, um, what the DUP wants, which is that they're saying, oh, we don't want to have different regulations to the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, hello? You don't have abortion. You don't have gay marriage. You have a different tax rate. You have your own assembly, not that you use it. But you already are treated as a special region. And you know what? If we do pull out of the EU, if we don't get given a people's vote, if this horrible thing does happen, the best thing for Northern Ireland would be to have one foot in the EU and the other foot in the UK. What the DUP are demanding is that they give up that special status that they could have that would actually work really well in Northern Ireland's favour. Wouldn't work well in our favour, but you know, Northern Ireland, they'll be, they'll be laughing. We're still part of the single market, still part of the customs union. And at the moment, there are checks on goods coming across from the island of Ireland to the island of Great Britain. Because if it's anything agricultural, we have to check for foot and mouth, we have to check for BSE and other diseases like that. So the checks at the moment in the North Sea. So that's another line. That Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I love from the DUP. Are they doing witch burning again? <laughs> or is that gone? I think uh, they're busy worried about the dinosaurs. But... Okay, yeah, but question over there. At the back. Thank you. Um, yes, Penny Roberts from RP. Uh, it was picking up on uh, Graham's point about potential shortage of vital medicines and pharmaceutical products uh, if we Brexit. And I just wanted to let people know that this is actually happening now. I uh, heard this afternoon from two people who have had problems for the first time ever getting hold of their normal insulin supplies, one for themselves and one for a member of their family. This has never happened before. Uh, they've had one person has contact with the pharmaceutical industry who won't go public, won't be named, but is saying that they are already being told the pharmaceutical industry are diverting supplies of vital things right into them in order to start building up those stockpiles. So that's not that's not gonna be happening in March or now. At the moment nobody wants to go public on this, it's all rumour, but I just wanted to ask if there's anybody knows, if any of you have problems or family have problems getting hold of essential drugs now. Um, and if anybody has contact in the pharmaceutical industry who might be interested or willing to talk to the press, then we're going to try and run a story on this. So could you talk to me, Penny Roberts from IP, or Kath Moss, who got to the so anybody having problems getting hold of their drugs, you know, yeah. pharmaceuticals, yeah. you know, yeah. insulin, you know, or has contacts within pharmaceuticals, or contacts where they know that there's going to be shortages because of the stock Okay, thanks. Excuse me, can I just um, uh, just check though, because there is actually a worldwide shortage of insulin yeah, at the moment. We need to be yeah. rigorous. If you're not too shy, come up and then say it on the microphone. Hi, I'm Carlo uh, Cainescu, and my question would be kind of both for the panelists and for uh, Manchester for Europe as an organization. If, fingers crossed, we do get the people people's vote, I think that it's pretty good. It will be us, the people in this room, who will be delivering the referendum campaign on the ground and will try to find ways to win this uh, new referendum. So my question for everybody would be, how do we do things differently than last time? How do you think, I, no, we as individuals who are going to be campaigning on the ground, what do you think we should be doing differently? 
everything. <laughs> well, we, we need to push positive positive to the EU. We need to not have David Cameron as our figurehead. We need to make sure that we explain to people, because one of the things that's annoyed me, especially about um, the Labour MPs, is that they've chosen to placate the racists in their community because they don't want to educate them. And I think that education is a massive part of this in terms of, well, I'm talking about school here, just making people understand how important the EU is to them. And that, you know what, the EU is not perfect and we need to be honest about that. It's got some certain aspects about it that could really do with improvement, but the only way we're going to do that is if we're part of the EU. We're not going to do it from outside. And so I think a bit of humility, I think a bit of, um, you know, positivity about the whole thing. And I also think that the, the, the grassroots groups like Manchester for York, Liverpool for York, Leeds for York, and all the different groups around the country working together is going to be massive and have a huge, huge impact. And I can see that if we all do work together, the people's votes could be, and I'm, I'm serious here, a remain vote of two thirds. And that would be stonking because that is what we main got in 1975 when we had the first referendum on whether we should be in Europe or not. <laughs> so yes, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to Durham, so I've got to go to get a 10 o'clock train. And Lovely I'm cathedral, by the way. Yes. Apparently it's 20 minutes for walk and it's 18 minutes too now, so I'm going to like it. I'm going to give Teddy a copy of the book here. But thank you all for coming. We all move in similar circles, so um, we don't have to answer the but um, Mike's staying here for a bit so he can answer some more, some more technical questions because he really does know his stuff. And I, I'm just repeating what other people have told me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. One of the finest examples of the Anglo Roman architecture in the country, Durham Cathedral. And actually, made it, I think it was one of the only buildings in Britain that actually made a. Uh... Oh, fantastic, I read it. I bet you went through four, four packs of cranes right in there. <laughs> right, that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Graham. Round of applause. I was going to say, we need to go with some food arriving, but if anyone wants pizzas, they want an idea of who wants them, so can you stick your hand up now? Oh, you're on the way anyway. Oh shit, you just guessed. I bet you want another six people sugaring the tea without asking them. Right, so again, we've got Graham here who's uh, the expert, so I get questions. Graham, just a question. I'm a European citizen. All of you are, and many of you, put your names down on the two European petitions, one of which is still running, to retain your European citizenship. The rest of you, why not? Because get it done, get it done. That's right. We find it. Michael, if, if you can help with this, please do. Okay, um, oh, oh, I'm going to get moved now, aren't I? Um, listen, there's a difference between... This is a very good example, actually, of the difference between the, the legal situation and the political situation. The legal situation is dead, dead clear. If you're not a national of a member state, you're not an EU citizen. And there's no exceptions, there's no way to keep it, there's nothing you can do about it. Legally speaking, if you're not a national of a member state, you're not an EU citizen. However, politically, if there's a, enough people who are saying we are outraged, we are disappointed, we are scandalized, we are horrified, we want to retain our European citizenship, it's a very useful way of reminding the EU institutions and the other member states that Theresa May does not speak for the whole of the UK. Now this is one of the things that, that, that you learn when you're doing e e EU work, is that, that the member states and the EU institutions rely very heavily on the official contact points to know how a country is thinking. They're not reading the papers like we are, they're not attending meetings like this, they're relying on the official government spokespeople for what the view of the country is. Anything which you can do to bypass the official view of Theresa May and actually voice your feelings and your thoughts directly to the EU institutions or directly to the other member states has an inherent value. Even if it can't necessarily lead to a particular legal outcome, it has a really important 
value. And the second reason it's uh, important and valuable is that the European Parliament, to its credit, is actually very supportive of the idea of having some sort of system whereby if the UK does leave, and of course we all hope that it doesn't happen, but if the UK does leave, that they introduce some sort of regime to give a sort of associate citizenship to UK citizens who want to opt into it. Again, the more that the European Parliament senses that there's a groundswell of public opinion that would support that option, the more valuable it is. So legally speaking, maybe not the best news in the world, but politically, that's the way it Just one comeback on that. Do you know how else you can lose your EU citizenship? By being a mass murderer or horrendous criminal, a huge tax fraudster, etc. That is the only other way. Are you all criminals? No. Get online, get it done! I could say the sneaky one for me and my kids, of course, my parents are both Irish and again, Northern Ireland, we can get our EU citizenship anyway. In fact, we're going to have one more, one more question. One more question, a second from the back. Yeah. All right, look. Yeah, you, go on. Sorry, mate, you look too eager. <laughs> Girls look like the stalkery one. <laughs> so my question is to Michael. Um, is there a danger, if there is any withdrawal agreement, there will be an attempt to smuggle us into a blind Brexit. So those you don't, we won't have a vote. So you know, we won't be able to vote on anything substantive at all. So, so Theresa May's strategy is pretty clear. It's, been, it's Brexit at any cost. Huh? This is her strategy. It's been her strategy for quite a long time. It's just delivering Brexit. Um, she doesn't particularly care what comes after. She doesn't particularly care what the consequences are. It's delivering Brexit. Um, and there's a couple of dangers that, that are associated with any of the particular outcomes that Theresa May might bring back. First of all, let's remind ourselves what Theresa May promised. She promised that already by this date, and not just Theresa May, but her government as a whole, she promised that we'd have not just the withdrawal agreement with the EU, but we'd have completely finalized our entire future relationship with Europe. And not just in trade, but in security, defense, science, the environment, all the rest of it. What is, what, what is the best that she's actually going to get? She's going to get a 10-page heads of terms which outlines what the possible principles are for the future negotiations about the relationship between the EU and the UK. By her very own standards, she is a complete and utter failure. Total failure. Let's remind ourselves as well, and this links up to what Graham said before. Uh, Neil Fox stood up in Parliament in September 2016 and said he was absolutely confident, absolutely confident, that within 12 to 14 months, i.e. the September just passed, he would have completed a full round of global trade negotiations between Britain and the rest of the world. What's his current tally? Zero. Zero. So these people are going to try and pretend that whatever pathetic little deal they bring back is a triumph. And that's their tactic. But there's another thing we've really got to bear in mind here. The, the most important part of Theresa May's deal, such as it is, is the transition period. Yeah? So the idea is that we leave in March 2019, but nobody notices any particular change for about two years. Because everything pretty much stays the same for that period of time. We lose all our voting rights, we lose all our influence, and no longer have any seat at the table. We become a complete rule taker, but nothing much changes for about two years. So the actual concrete consequences of Brexit only emerge when it's too late for anybody to do anything about it. And this is an entirely deliberate strategy. There were lots of different ways that Britain could have agreed a transitional period that wouldn't have acted like this. They were much more legally straightforward, much more politically straightforward. Theresa May's government deliberately designed a withdrawal deal that would deliver Brexit at any cost and the full consequences will not become clear for about two years afterwards. And by that stage, who are they going to blame? 
everyone in the world apart from your bloody selves who caused the mess in the first place. This is a deliberate attempt to escape accountability and transparency for the Brexit Brigade who have actually caused this entire mess. And I think that's a really important thing that we've got to bear in mind and an important message to get across. They are deliberately trying to trick the British people into thinking that Brexit isn't such a big deal and then suddenly when the shit hits the fan, it's somebody else's fault, not theirs. Uh, so I'm going to lose some more last questions, but we don't really have any uh, time for that now. Uh, I've got to say uh, thank you very much to, to Professor Michael Dugan. There is that feeling that we're always kicking the can down the road on Brexit, but it's getting uncomfortably close. Thank you very much for listening to me. Before I get off, let me please uh, introduce to you the un incoming chair of, uh, the, of uh, Manchester for Europe, uh, Kath uh, Moss. Well, the one with the last standing <laughs> on the panel. Um, Michael, will you be hanging around? Because I know loads of people still want to ask questions. So. I, 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 I still very come to Manchester that I've got no idea what time the last train's at, but I'm going to get to the last train, whatever time it's at. Um, so I'll be hanging around until then. Okay, so I'm sure if you buy Michael a drink and ask him a question, I'm sure he'll be very happy to answer before he catches his last train. And a big thanks also to Terry. And we'd love to see far more of you with us on our street schools, Terry. Ask me. Tomorrow, Ferry. Uh, tomorrow. St. Anne's Square. Okay, we'll keep in touch. We really need you to help us turn this around. So I hope everybody here feels inspired to take, take the fight that we are gonna win in the next few weeks. Um, a few points just read tonight. Uh, we have ordered some pizza because I'm starving yeah. and I'm, I, I'm yeah. thinking that so the pizza's here. Please do, please do tuck in if you can sort of put in a voluntary, I don't know, two quid a piece or something like that just to cover the cost. That would be great. Um, picking up, I think, on Andrea Davis's point, um, if you've not done your postcards to Theresa May and your MP yet, then take a third and take one if you have done them and send one to Jeremy Corbyn. I think we owe that to Andrew Adonis that Jeremy Corbyn gets 200 postcards from us tonight. Um, we've also got um, some merchandise at the back. Please do have a look at it, you know, and if there's anything there, you can look at um, t shirts or whatever. Um, then please, you know, get involved and buy, buy whatever you can. Um, we've also got a raffle. If you've not got your raffle uh, tickets, please do buy some. They are to cover the costs of the band and of the evening. Um, we will, well, we've not been very good at timekeeping, so if I say half past 10, it'll probably be 11, but we will we'll do the raffle by 11 o'clock tonight, For because you know, obviously I know some of you want to go. Um, I'm hoping that loads of you don't, I'm hoping that those of you will stay around. We've got an evening of music now ahead of us with Rock for Europe. We will have to move some of the chairs away, so it'd be great if you, if you can help. Um, but otherwise, we're going to take a little break now. I think Fellow Bojo is going to come and entertain while we sort of sort the room out. Um, our very own Boris Johnson. So please hang around, have some pizza, and let's have a really good rest of the night and, and be inspired. Let's see everybody here on the street stools moving forward. Thank you. Yeah.